Thanks, Mark. Uh, let me just for a moment home back on what Steve was saying earlier, that uh, the number of Afghans in the United States has uh, incremented dramatically. And if my memory is right, he said something like it's about at 133,000 now. Well, keeping in mind that 124,000 people were just evacuated out of Afghanistan, uh, the vast majority of whom are not U.S. citizens or green card holders, what that functionally means is that we could potentially double the number of Afghans in the United States in a very short period of time just to take care of those who were evacuated from the country. And that doesn't even touch upon those who will be a continuing stream, such as uh, Nela has described. Let me also touch briefly for a minute on this idea of parole as a class. Um, the law is very clear that parole is only supposed to be used for, you know, um, extreme humanitarian reasons on a case by case basis. So the notion that you can simply wave a magic wand and say it's OK to parole tens of thousands of individuals is wrong. That, in at least my opinion and that of any number of other individuals and legal scholars, is uh, an abuse, perhaps uh, abuse of the parole law, perhaps illegal. But the question is, who has standing to fight that? Um, very few people. And even more importantly, who has the um, political will? And it, at this point, I doubt there's anybody. But it is an abuse of the notion of parole, which was always intended to be um, a, uh, a course of last resort. Um, for those who are uh, watching and listening now, let me uh, encourage them to take a look at Nayla's um, most recent posting because it is uh, an eye opener and deserves to be read very thoroughly and carefully. Um, and let me therefore um, key on that and, and move along. One of the interesting things that we've seen um, with the administration as we have gone along through this really messy and chaotic process is a kind of shifting, 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 stepping back from their uh, initial assertions. For instance, at first the administration was saying, everyone who has been taken out of Afghanistan and brought to the US has been thoroughly vetted. Well, that's patently untrue and it's become um, very evident from some of the cases that, that Nayla cites in her blog um, and there are uh, innumerable anecdotes that continue to confirm that that's not true. Um, most recently, uh, a flight um, had at least four individuals on it who had active cases of measles, which caused a temporary shutdown of flights um, because of the fact that there was a pretty good possibility that in a 14 hour flight um, moving from Doha to the United States using recirculated air, um, any number of other individuals were susceptible to, to contracting that case of measles. And uh, not too long ago, I wrote a backgrounder on some legislation that was pending in Congress. And among the things that I noted is that in Afghanistan, hemorrhagic fever and tuberculosis, tuberculosis are all too common. So you have to ask yourself, how many of the individuals that got thrown onto these flights to go to Doha or directly um, to Dulles, where they were dispersed to various uh, military bases, might also have had active cases of COVID, tuberculosis, or whatever. And only after the fact will um, US um, public health authorities catch on to that and be trying to take care of it. It's a, it's a serious issue. Um, also, um, we have heard some egregious, but uh, I think very credible reports of some things like, in one instance, an American immigration attorney loaded up a charter flight of his clients and had them flown to the US military air base outside of Doha, where they flew around and demanded and were ultimately granted um, landing permission where they offloaded all of those individuals. Who were they? We don't really know. Um, it's pretty amazing to me that that happened, but uh, that is an example of the kind of thing that, that has occurred because there don't seem to have been any controls or, or any governors on this moving train wreck 
to um, preclude that from happening. Um, we also have uh, seen credible reports in the media that already some of the people in the United States were detected as having been prior deports who were removed from the United States for serious crimes um, up to and including rape. In another instance, an individual who was still on a military post um, was flagged and charged with grand larceny um, because he apparently was either stealing military supplies and equipment or perhaps engaging in theft from some of his fellow refugees. So he's now being held while they ponder what to do with him since it's gonna be a real conundrum um, to try and send any of these indiv individuals back to Afghanistan now that the Taliban has taken over. Um, as Nayla has noted, the administration is now admitting that the vast majority of those evacuated are not citizens or green card holders. They're not, in fact, even um, special immigrant visa grantees or applicants. Um, and so they cover that by using phrases like refugee and at-risk individuals. But really, that's anybody in uh, Afghanistan short of being a certified Taliban member. Um, particularly since the administration has um, defined a category of refugee as being an individual in Afghanistan who simply um, opposes living there. That could be an economic refugee. It, does, it falls outside the usual parameters of an individual being a refugee based on the five designated grounds, which are um, persecution or likely persecution on the base of uh, race, political belief, religion, et cetera, et cetera. These are just Afghans at large. Um, there is also a very disturbing report that uh, at, when the American embassy in Kabul received instructions to start shredding and destroying classified materials, among the things that they destroyed en masse were the SIV application packages with the supporting documentation and the passports of people who had submitted them. If that's true, the question arises, how then are they going to be able to legitimately document who was in the queue at the time? It'll be a near impossibility to reconstruct any of that, um, which leaves people who were legitimately um, among those who helped the US seriously at risk to be able to prove their claim. Another thing that has been incredibly fuzzy, and I think deliberately so, is the demographics of those who are coming out of Afghanistan. It's going to be interesting to find out how many of those are in fact, for instance, the elderly or women and children, and how many are adult males of what might be considered fighting age, say from the age of 18 to 35. I suspect in the fullness of time we may find that a significant number of the people who barged their way onto those flights um, and got past the Taliban checkpoints are fairly young adult males, and that should be a great concern to the United States. So, you know, the question is exactly what is vetting? Um, it's not magic, it's not a cure-all. Um, it consists of four general kinds of things. First is biographic information. Um, you want to look at the individual's name, date and place of birth, the details of their lives as they claim them, and you want to be able to match that up against whatever is in U.S. databases. Second, and this is actually um, a better referent but less available, is the biometrics fingerprints, palm prints, iris scans, signatures, things that are very difficult to change or even impossible to change. But the reality is that there aren't biometric indicia on the greater number of people coming out of Afghanistan. So absent that information, and given the fact that um, with biographic data, you have the added complication that it's a different language and a different script, you can spell Muhammad a dozen different ways, Abdullahi several different ways. When you're trying to check names based simply on, on biographic data, 
particularly when you don't have access to the uh, vital statistics and registration documents such as they exist in Afghanistan, which we don't anymore, um, it leaves those who are doing the scrubbing and vetting uh, in a conundrum. So what do they do then? They, in, in Afghanistan, what they would have done is they would have relied on people in the field, including the military, to go out to the various towns and villages and provinces of the individual and tried to pin down some of the facts to see whether they were um, embroidering or just spinning out of whole cloth. They can't do that. We have no footprint in Afghanistan to double check what someone claims now. And then finally, you have a different kind of vetting and that involves the, the physical vetting for health purposes, x-rays, physical examinations, uh, I've already touched on that. Yes, that's going to happen, but the problem is that it seems to be at the end of the pipeline and not at the beginning, which means that even people exposed to someone who is sick on one of those um, flights may become infected, whether it's with COVID or something else. And that means that there are potentially a lot of, going to be a lot of people with disease vectors who at, you know get at least as far as Doha, or some of the other military places where they're being um, squared away right, <clears throat> excuse me, right now. And that leaves the potential for them to um, spread that disease further. It's, it's a question. Um, so another question that arises is, what exactly is the vetting pinging against? And the answer to that is US databases. That would include a variety of databases, immigration databases, to, you know, for someone who may have been in the U.S. previously, such as the prior deports I mentioned previously, or someone who applied previously and was denied for a visa for a multiplicity of reasons. There will be law enforcement databases. Those generally only apply also to someone who's been in the United States. If they've been arrested, whether it's by uh, state or local police or the FBI, that will be in those databases. Um, there are CIA and NSA databases. Um, those will likely involve um, a lot of signal intercepts of conversations, et cetera. And then there are military databases. And those are interesting because the military has been very good at um, collecting uh, caches of documents, weapons, bombs, uh, in the course of their operations in Afghanistan and, and done a great job of taking latent fingerprints and all kinds of data off of that material, which they have then categorized to reflect that the individuals who were touching these things were likely bad guys. The problem now is there are not going to be any more military operations in Afghanistan. Uh, we would be fools to think that we had gathered enough biometric information on even a fraction of the people who are Taliban members, Al Qaeda members, ISIS members, or their sympathizers. Um, we're nowhere near that point. So where does that leave um, vetters? It leaves them pinging against what's already in the system. And if they are very good and they notice discrepancies, having enough time and resources to be able to personally interview at length, multiple times if necessary, to decide whether or not this individual represents a threat. Um, my gauge is there is much too much political pressure to move them along. Um, the host governments, such as in Qatar, um, even the US military is gonna wanna move people off their bases as quickly as possible. That imposes time constraints that make it extremely difficult to do the kind of vetting that needs done given the um, curtailed circumstances based on our exit. Um, I fear that a lot of people uh, will get through because there isn't anything to ping against, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these individuals are clean and that they don't represent some kind of threat or risk to the United States. They may. And then finally, we have a whole different question, and that is of fraud. The Iraqi special immigrant visa program was so rife with fraud that it had to be suspended because um, of the volume of counterfeit and doctored documents 
and lies that were submitted to gain access to the program. There's no reason to think that that wasn't, isn't also going to be the case here, particularly since, as Nayla says, um, there's going to be even more pressure for people to try and uh, funnel their way into the United States through that program. We have already experienced instances of that kind of fraud. It's been reported in the media in the United States, in Germany, and in France. Uh, that's incredible, given that we're still at the early days of this um, whole evacuation process. And then lastly, we have an issue that's more difficult to articulate, and that has to do with culture and assimilation. Um, it's heartening that, as Steve says, um, Afghans have a very high rate of naturalization. But keep in mind that the people who will be coming now are not people who generally have had ties to relatives in the United States or uh, other things that might prepare them for life um, outside the village, outside their tribal system, their clan system. Um, a 2013 Pew Research Center study showed that 99% of Afghans believe strongly in Sharia law, not just in religious matters, but for the law of the land. These are people who are now going to come to a very liberal society that very clearly distinguishes between your religious rights and the civil foundation of law. I suspect that's going to cause a tremendous amount of um, difficulty in assimilating. And in the worst instances, it can result in things such as we've seen in the past uh, of honor killings of one's wife or daughter or sister. If you feel that they have become too westernized and, and strayed too far from uh, Sharia. And I think that's one of the reasons why in, in Steve's recitation, he talked about the fact that women in Afghan families rarely work. That is in keeping with the kind of Sharia that is practiced in Afghanistan, where women are discouraged from being anywhere except in the home. So as we look ahead, we're going to see a multiplicity of problems, not least of which is doing an adequate job of vetting with limited information, much of which has been uh, whisked out from under the feet of the U.S. officials charged with making those decisions in a very short period of time.